I am from CDSL Commodity Repository Limited. And this entire setup is under the regulatory framework of Warehousing Development and Regulatory Authority. In short, we call it as WDRA. Now, what is WDRA and what are the principal roles? We'll come into that. So WDRA comes under the Ministry of Consumer Affairs and their primary duty is about registration of warehouses. Now, when we say registration of warehouses, it also includes various steps that they take as developmental steps, which are like awareness programs, uh, more uh, enlightenment about the good practices in warehouse operations. Those are also part of their activities. Now, this WDRA, they have set up repository for generating and maintenance of electronic negotiable warehouse receipts. This WDRA, they, are, uh, they, are, they have been set up with the background of one Warehouse Development and Regulator Regulation Act that was of 2007. Now, after that act, WDRA was set up in 2010 and in 2017, repository was set up for electronic negotiable warehouse receipts. Now, one obvious question all of you must be getting that what happened between 2010 and 2017? So why this uh, extra years of seven years? Now, there was nothing like somebody was sitting idle or there was no activity happening between 2010 and 2017. The warehouse receipts and specifically the negotiable warehouse receipts, which were issued by those registered warehouses, they were in physical form. They were getting issued by those registered warehouses in physical form. And post 2017, the negotiable warehouse receipts are now issued in electronic form. So for capturing this or stepping up this negotiable warehouse receipts into electronic form, repositories were set up. And CCRL is one of those repositories which got license for uh, giving this service to all the warehouses, all the clients. Now, just to give you the background, CCRL is promoted by CDSL, which is the Securities Market Repository. As I said, that Securities Market, it happened 23, 24 years back. And our other shareholders are two prominent exchanges of India. One is Bombay Stock Exchange and one is Multi Commodity uh, Exchange of India. Now, how does this help? Why I am putting this information to you is the pedigree, what we call as pedigree in our genetics term, and what we call in general term, we can uh, say that it is the, you know, generation wise, how we carry forward the uh, carry forward the uniqueness of that particular thing that is carried forward from CDSL to CCR. Because CDSL had been uh, giving service to the securities market for a very long time with much experience, much ups and downs, all the issues they have seen in those years. So same things, we started our uh, repository building from that experience. So it is nothing like that. We have started from scratch. We have taken forward the experience that CDSL had in securities market. From that experience, we carried forward this repository concept. And we established ourselves in very quick time and with all the facilities that anybody would expect from a repository. Now, if we extend this discussion, how does it help the market? Okay. And how it is more inclusive for the market to adopt it? These are two questions when we, you know, first set up this repository. Uh, these questions were thrown to repository as a challenge, which came out from the experience of warehouses. Now, at warehouses, we all know that uh, sometimes they are in semi-rural or semi-urban places, a little away from the main city. So, how does it connect to a particular repository, which we are saying that it is electronic a platform for negotiable warehouse generation, negotiable warehouse receipt generation? So, first and foremost thing is we made it a web based application. We all know that how easy it is and how acquainted everyone is with the mobile phone, the internet, uh, the online transactions. 
we all know that so we made it so easy for everybody to operate on repository platform so that there is no hitch there is no uh, restriction there is no resistance from anybody to operate on it and how does it help any user this web based application you can operate from your mobile you can operate from any pc any laptop any device which is connected to internet so this is much easier than having any particular application on mobile because application requires separate device controls separate uh, downloading and all this ccrl application does not require all that second thing is when we are making it web based application the other feature we have added to it is its authentication of user now how that becomes important we will discuss a uh, little later when such a discussion comes up but that is one of the most important point that who is accessing the application to generate negotiable warehouse receipt to issue generate issue nwrs to transfer the nwrs how that user authentication is done that is also uh, was one of the major challenges because users were very diverse in nature somewhere from very distant warehouses somewhere from very small warehouses but you know we uh, in a kind of we managed to overcome those challenges now another aspect which comes uh, inherent with this uh, uh, electronic platform is how we secure the data okay how we secure the information so uh, that part is also one of the major challenges a repository faces but uh, being the you know uh, one of the companies which has come from the cdsl pedigree we were quite confident about the practices of information security and we are very religiously following it i will not go into much detail of it because it's highly technical and may not be much suitable for this audience today but i am just giving an information basis that information security is one of the primary pillars of ccrl and similarly the business continuity uh, that is also uh, quite required business continuity by the definition it means that whenever there is some hit, some natural tra uh, tragedy or some disturbance in the continuity of business or in operations of an organization how we manage so basically it requires that more than one location is used by uh, the repository <coughs> for its information storage and operations so we call it primary data center and uh, disaster recovery center so that way there are two locations that ccrl is using so whenever uh, some disaster comes uh, ccrl will be up and operative from any of those locations so that is uh, in very brief it is covered under the business continuity management system one second now we come to the specific point of today's discussion that uh, what are the issues and challenges that we face today in this electronic negotiable warehouse receipt system so i have categorized it in three parts first is regulatory issues second operational issues and third one is commercial issues as i have explained earlier that uh, there is one warehousing development and regulation act based on which wdra is set up now uh, we have seen many acts we are facing many acts regularly in our uh, life like we have the traffic rules that we follow we all know that we cannot drive a two wheeler or four wheeler uh, or any other vehicle without a proper driving license we know that and it is well imbibed in our day-to-day uh, -day practice that we carry our license and then only we operate on some vehicle now the basic part of that traffic rule is without license we cannot drive or we cannot ride a two-wheeler you know so that part is missing in warehousing sector that's why i have kept it in the list of issues like in our example of license we are saying that without license we cannot ride a bike without license we cannot drive a four wheeler but without wdra license we can operate a warehouse today so that is where the ambiguity comes because wdra act 
does not make it mandatory for every warehouse to operate and uh, thus does not make it mandatory for them to <clears throat> get the license from WDRA to operate. That means what practically, if you go to a location where different warehouses are there, you may find few warehouses are registered with WDRA, few warehouses are not registered with WDRA. So as a client, that becomes quite challenging for them because not all of them are well aware that the warehouses which are registered with WDRA are backed up by an act of parliament, backed up by rules of government, giving support to the legality of the instrument. When I say instrument, it is the negotiable warehouse receipt. It is like any other instrument you operate today, like you are having check, you are having demand draft. Similarly, you are having a negotiable warehouse receipt. So that negotiable warehouse receipt as an instrument, it is backed by this act of parliament. It is backed by the rules of government. So while going on that road where you have different warehouses one after another, you don't realize the difference between a registered warehouse from a non-registered warehouse, simply from the appearance of the warehouse. So what the client has to do, client will go to the WDRA site. They will check whether the warehouses of that particular area, how many are registered, which one is registered, and then they come to know that this warehouse is registered. Now, the risk factor here is, suppose the client goes to a non-registered warehouse, and the warehouse is issuing some receipt and giving him, and the client is operating on that, you know, taking loans from the banks, or they are giving, uh, they are transferring it to another person. So, such activities, on any receipt issued by a non-registered warehouse, it is not having any legal backing. That part clients are not able to understand just from the appearance of the warehouse. So in contrast to that, when I say it issue, there should be some solution to that. In contrast to that, if WDRA Act would have been mandatory on all warehouses to operate, then the situation would have been different. So the client, you know, walking or driving through a road, all the warehouses which are there operating on those particular uh, aspects, say agri commodities, if we take example. So such warehouses, there is no distinction. Every warehouse is registered. Every warehouse is operating under a standard operating procedure. Every warehouse is giving ENWR, which is backed by uh, one act and rules of government. So there is no difference. The only difference would be the service levels of those warehouses. But the client is well assured in such a case because they are getting the warehouse receipt, which is a genuine negotiable warehouse receipt. Now, just to uh, support this point, as all of you are well experienced, you know that warehouses often issue uh, warehouse receipts, which are transferred between each other, which are pledged with banks. Negotiable warehouse receipt when the term is used negotiable means one person can transfer it to another person so in case of loans you will say that it is not transferred between one another it remains with the holder only the bank is funding but the pledge funding concept itself says that when there is a lien marking when there is a pledge on that particular instrument then actually the owner of the goods is the lending agency, the bank, the NBFC, which is lending on that. Okay, till the time the borrower is repaying the loan. So in that case also, negotiability of the particular warehouse receipt is very important and is a must. So in absence of this act being mandatory on all the warehouses uh, for their registration, there are many warehouses which are not registered today. There are many warehouses which are issuing warehouse receipts and on those warehouse receipts, there are pledge fundings, there are transfer of uh, ownership, all those things are happening. But if you go into the depth of it, a warehouse receipt, which is there issued from a non-registered warehouse cannot be negotiable at all. Negotiable warehouse receipt can be issued only by such warehouses, which are registered with WDRA. That's the rule says. So there is one, you know, gap or gray area in this where the regulations today 
are not complete in a sense that they don't mandate for a warehouse to register themselves to operate. The other challenge today uh, in the second category, as I have said, there are many, many operational issues. You know, I have listed a few major ones and all of you being, <coughs> sorry, experienced enough would appreciate that there may be, you know, many more that than this, what I have mentioned in the slide and those numbers are much higher. But if we go to the major ones, the first one I have listed here is quality testing. In many of your warehouses, you must be storing agri commodities, non agri commodities, and while issuing the warehouse receipts, there is a valuation of what is getting stored. Now, when we say valuation of what is getting stored, specifically for agri commodities, value is what is getting into the warehouse and of what quality it is. That is of primary importance because agri commodities are mostly perishable. Some are very perishable in nature, like we know vegetables, fruits, they are, uh, they are counted today as perishables. Some are having a little higher shelf life, which can be stored for four months, six months, 10 months, or, you know, a couple of years also. So, uh, that kind of perishability and limitation of shelf life is there in the agri commodities. So that is one factor why testing is required. Second factor is there is no uniformity. So a rice grown in Punjab, paddy grown in Punjab and paddy grown in Tamil Nadu will be of different variety. Even if they are of same variety, they will have different output quality levels because you know uh, the agricultural pattern the kind of water in used in such production the kind of soil quality in that area all will be uh, varying like that so there is no uniformity in somebody bringing paddy it may be a punjab paddy which is of different quality it may be a tamil nadu paddy or maybe any other place of india so that quality varies so that is why Quality testing becomes of prime importance because you have to evaluate the commodity which you are going to store and issue the warehouse receipt. Now, when we say quality testing, many of you must be following the quality testing practices in your warehouses. You will ask the question, sir, how it is difficult? We follow it day in day out. But there is the catch. Even if you are following it, there are certain standards to follow it. Now, when we come to standards, those standards also differ. You know, uh, standard for <coughs> AGMAC, as they have defined, say, we take the same example. For PADI, the quality testing parameters defined by AGMAC are different. There are certain derivatives market where commodity exchanges are operative. So there the quality testing parameters may or may not be different, but that's a, uh, you know, that's where the boundary is that if it is different, then the practices of storing valuation of commodity also will be different. Procurement quality as defined by uh, institutions like Food Corporation, NAFED, those parameters are again a different category altogether. So even though if you are doing a quality testing, you have to follow certain standards and it all depends on which market you are catering to. Market means it is the end use of that particular commodity which you are getting stored at your warehouse. If it is procurement oriented, you will be following either Food Corporation or NAFED, NAFED specifically for oil seeds and pulses. So you will be following the quality parameters defined by them. Now, if it is for derivatives market, you will be following the quality parameters defined by the commodity exchange. And if it is for some pledge funding uh, objective, you will be following the quality parameters given by the bank, which are to be tested for that particular commodity. And then the bank will fund on that particular warehouse receipt. So in absence of uniformity, that also becomes one of the challenges I have listed out for, you know, giving something very uniform to the market, giving assurance to the market that this is of this particular grade, this commodity, this cargo is of this particular grade because you have different, different standards. Now, 
if we come to the resolution of this issue of quality testing, how does it happen? Now, when the electronic negotiable warehouse receipt, as we are discussing in this ecosystem of WDRA, ENWR, if it is adopted, ENWR gives the complete information that this is tested as per this standard, this is of this grade, and its value is this. Now, if you say that as a warehouse operator, I also write the value on the warehouse receipts. I know all the warehouses, they are writing the value on warehouse receipts. For client, that becomes more challenging because you don't know what is the source of that information. If a particular warehouse is issuing warehouse receipts saying that, you know, 3,400 per quintal is the price of wheat that they have received in their warehouse, you never know whether that 3,400 is that day's price, whether that 3,400 is, you know, correct price of that particular variety, or if there are any, uh, you know, hidden agenda behind that for giving a wrong price on the warehouse receipt. But there is also a possibility that the client and warehouse connive themselves together and try to cheat the bank. That has also happened in multiple cases. The valuation of the commodity is hyped in the warehouse receipt. And then it is pledge funded by a particular bank without even realizing that the values written in the warehouse receipt are much higher than the actual value of the commodity. <coughs> so as, as we go through all these points, we know that the agri commodities, agri commodities storage, agri commodities valuation, this is a very complex topic and there are various variations, various, uh, uh, you know, gray areas, points of cheating, which are available there. And throughout this period, when this repository or the ENWR concept was not there, many institutions, many stakeholders, they have burnt their fingers because of these, uh, you know, uh, wrong practices followed, which are very difficult to catch at the primary point. But these issues, when we discuss them, they are resolved with ENWR, if we, if I can tell in short, but how they are resolved? Because you have a particular quality testing standardized method given to the warehouse. Because you have a particular SOP, standard operating procedure of testing given to the warehouse to operate. Because you have valuation of commodities very well defined that, you know, for this location, this particular commodity, this is the price which is prevailing today. So any variation, you know, which is beyond a particular percentage of that price, ENWR generation is not allowed in that area. So it is location, commodity, Monday price, that way it is, you know, uh, that is getting implemented now. So very soon you will see that aspect also uh, in the ENWR, which you are operating today. So these are getting standardized. Standardized for whom? These are getting standardized for the stakeholders, for the users, for their benefit, for their risk mitigation, so that they are not cheated. Okay. Now, the other points which I have mentioned in operational issues, storage practices, of course, uh, if majority of you are into warehousing, you know what does it mean? It means the various practices of proper preservation of goods. It relates to fumigation of the goods. It relates to stacking of goods. It relates to humidity control in the warehouses. These are all very important points. And why it is listed in the issue? Because these all points, they ultimately, ultimately they result into the, they affect the quality and quantity of the goods. If the goods are not fumigated properly on time, there are chances that it will be infested by pests. And when infested, the grains or oil seeds or pulses, whatever it is, the weight of it, the quality of it will come down. And as the quality comes down, the value of the particular lot, particular cargo will come down. So what you have stored in the warehouse and what you are taking out from the warehouse, there will be a value difference. So who will bear that value difference? That remains the question mark. So that's why the storage practices become a major issue in warehousing. And how this ENWR ecosystem restores the confidence in the stakeholders, that also we will discuss. Manpower is another issue 
uh, uh, I will tell you in ENWR system, when the warehouse is onboarded on a repository system, certain basic educational qualification uh, and skill sets are required. First of all, uh, the person should be computer literate. So that becomes uh, sometimes challenge in many parts of India that a particular warehouse operators, they are not that computer literate. That's why I have listed it here. So basically when you are getting into some online system, uh, some electronic system, literacy of operating the application, that becomes challenging for repository. On this, we continuously uh, uh, undertake these awareness programs. We go into the depths of geography, uh, very interior places, and we conduct programs so that there is one initial uh, a momentum created with that warehouse that this is how it is operated. This is how the application of repository is operated. This is how you are going to generate the electronic negotiable warehouse receipt. But to get into the practice for generating the ENWR daily, uh, operating on that application daily, that still remains a challenge uh, for the warehouse operators. And the last part I have uh, mentioned here is compliance uh, for a registered warehouse, compliance to WDRA rules, WDRA regulations, all those points are very important. I will give you an example. There are various compliances, means uh, the list goes on, but I will give you a couple of examples. First is the insurance requirements. Okay. WDRA has defined a set of risks where insurance has to be there for the warehouse, for the goods they are storing. Now, how different it is from the existing practices that many of you must be knowing where, you know, warehouses are not registered with WDRA. It is the will and wish of the warehouse, whether they take insurance, they don't take insurance, they take the insurance for all the risk. All these are variables in those areas, in that particular warehouse. There is no fixed rule that they have to take burglary insurance. There is no fixed rule that they will take the theft insurance. There is no fixed rule whether they will take the standard fire uh, insurance like that. So it is the wish, and wish of the warehouse person that they take some insurance, which is you know basic mandated by the client or which is the basic requirement by the bank, which is funding on the warehouse receipt. So they take it. But if we keep it voluntary for the warehouse, we definitely know that 100% risks will not be covered. Second thing, we are exposing the client, the holder of the goods, to do those risks which are not covered under the insurance. I will give you an example. If, say, today is 23rd of June and the warehouse has not taken a standard fire uh, insurance for the warehouse where they are storing the goods and there is a fire incident today. Okay. Now, where does the client go? The warehouse will not have the capacity to compensate the client completely because these agri commodities they are stored, they are of high value. And if it is fire at the warehouse, so goods are lost <coughs> to a great extent. So monetary compensation by the warehouse on its own is next to impossible. So what do the client do? If the goods are not insured, it will be complete loss for the, for the client to book in his records. That's why WDRA mandates a registered warehouse to take insurance for those risks which are possible in a storage condition. Okay. When I say it is one issue, so even being registered, we have seen, we have experienced that warehouses, sometimes their insurance policies are, uh, you know, not operative today because they have not renewed it. Sometimes their insurance policies are not complete for all the risks given by WDRA. So that becomes another challenge for a registered warehouse to comply with the insurance policies mandated by WDRA. So like this insurance policy is one. There are multiple, multiple, you know, uh, uh, items in the compliance list of WDRA, which we all know that with time, with proper education, with training, it will all fall in place and it is slowly happening also. 
but this is uh, one of the challenges we are facing today. Third category, if we see, uh, it is I have categorized as commercial issues. Whatever issues we have discussed in the previous uh, this thing, operational issues, previous category we have discussed, they all lead to one thing. You know, if we are not following today, if we are have to follow that tomorrow, so there will be a cost escalation in the operation. For example, we all know that you know certain warehouses they are not testing the agri commodities which is coming into the warehouse for storage. They are simply writing you know it is of fair average quality or some some quality they are writing it, which is having no detailed definition by itself. If we insist that after registration you will check the quality on this X Y Z parameters, so the associated costs. For testing quality, first of all, they need to have a skilled worker there. Okay. With the skilled worker, you need to have some basic equipments at the warehouse. First, to take out the samples. Second, to test the samples. Okay. Third, after the te after testing of the samples, you need to report it. So that reporting structure, reporting procedure also needs to be defined. So if we only take this quality testing as one point, to uh, establish all these compliances in place, the cost at the warehouse operations will escalate. That's why I have mentioned that point in one of the commercial issues. Many warehouses, they resist to come up to this level by incurring certain costs, and they say that you know registration of warehouse is costly affair. So that's the general statement, but if we break down, yes, it is costly, but it is for good for client. It is for good of the warehouse. Second is incentivization. This is also uh, related to commercial aspect of the client. You know, when we say registered warehouse, what is the incentive I am getting? By this, what I mean, suppose you are going on a road, you have, you know, one on the right hand side is a registered warehouse, one on the left hand side is a non registered warehouse, a normal warehouse where you all are, many of you must be operating today. Now, if I store agri commodities in a registered warehouse, I get ENWR, electronic negotiable warehouse receipt. I take that ENWR to a bank, you know, X bank I am taking to. I am getting a loan from the warehouse receipt from the bank. My rate of interest for my loan is, say, 10.5%. Okay. When I go to the non registered warehouse on the left hand side of the road, I store the goods. Similarly, I get a warehouse receipt. I go to the same bank X. The bank also funds me, uh, uh, extends loan to me at 10.5%. So what is the difference? If I go to a registered warehouse, I am getting the loan at same rate. If I'm going to a non-registered warehouse, I am getting the loan at same rate of interest. So what is the difference? So that is where is the issue? There is no incentivization for a client to go to a registered warehouse. So in various forums, we have been discussing this and we have said that for a client who is going to a registered warehouse, suppose the rate of uh, interest is 25 basis points less. You know, because the client is entering into a disciplined environment, <clears throat> the client is entering into a legal environment. So there should be some assurance to the quality quantity of goods stored there. There should be some assurance for the warehouse operate to operate in that particular ecosystem. So all these assurances should work in a little lower rate of interest that the client is incurring with the bank because bank is much more assured than a non-registered warehouse. So many banks have thought upon it. There are internal discussions happening there. So there is some form of incentivization will happen in future. We are expecting that. So that remains one of the major commercial issues because this, you know, 25, 50 basis points, they make a good amount of money for a borrower. Third issue, which I have mentioned here is stakeholder network. As we speak, there are only about 3,200 registered warehouses which are operative across India. We all know how big is our country. 3,000 odd warehouses is nothing. Nothing means nothing, absolutely nothing. So 
as a client, if I walk into a, say a rural, semi-rural area, I want to store into a registered warehouse. Most likely I will get the nearest warehouse, which is 20, 25 kilometers away. So this network and this not only relates to warehouse, this relates to many things because there is one one uh, agency who will be doing your KYC, know your customer for getting a DMAT account. That agency's network is very thin. Warehousing network, registered warehousing network is very, very thin. So like that, even if the ecosystem speaks about itself being a legal ecosystem, it's spread across the nation is almost, you know, negligible. 3000 warehouses with, you know, very few agencies doing your KYC, very few agencies doing your transactions. So this entire ENWR ecosystem or repository ecosystem, we say, its acceptability is only to those people. Its usage is only by those people who know about this because the network is very, very thin spread. You know, so that becomes one of the most important challenges that we are facing today that the entire ecosystem, its availability to the clients, its availability to the users is very thin. And in fact, banks have been adopting this network, this ecosystem less primarily because <coughs> the warehouse network under registered warehouses is extremely low. For example, if they are doing uh, business in Telangana state, and they are you know, having a business target of say 10,000 crores of funding. But if the warehouses available in Telangana state, which are registered with WDRA are close to 30, 40 or 50, it's impossible that in entire year, which you know primarily will be two seasons, agriculture seasons, Kharif and Ravi crops will come. They achieve that 10,000 crores target is impossible. We should have much more warehouse network, we should have much more uh, agencies network who are servicing the clients for their DMAT account. So that becomes, you know, one of the major, major challenges in this ecosystem. Now, how over a period of time, WDRA has helped in this, helped in resolving these challenges. Okay, first for first is, of course, uh, not a resolution statement. It's a, a rule statement that negotiable warehouse receipts are a requirement by warehouse. Then registration with WDR is a must. As I said, that none of the warehouses which are not registered with WDRA can issue a negotiable warehouse receipt. Of course, they can issue any other warehouse receipt, but they cannot issue a negotiable warehouse receipt. As we say that, you know, act is not mandatory. It is voluntary for a warehouse to register itself with WDRA. So I must say at this juncture that there is many advanced discussions on amendment of Warehousing Patent Regulation Act 2007. Okay, so very soon it will be listed is expected to be listed in Parliament, and this amendment will actually pave the way for all warehouses. Uh, for them to get registered with WTRA as a mandatory purpose. If they want to operate as a warehouse, for them to register with WTRA will be mandatory. Very similar to the example that we uh, discussed earlier of a driving license. If you want to drive today, license is must. Tomorrow, if you want to operate a warehouse, WTRA license will be must after this amendment is passed by the parliament. For state warehousing corporations, I don't know uh, in the crowd, in the attendance today, there may be few from state warehousing corporations also. Uh, because of very low number of registrations happening in the past, WDRA has waived off the registration fee till September 22, 2022. So this coming September 2022, registration is free for all state warehousing corporations. So, as such, WDRA has written to the managing directors of all state warehousing corporations. So, even if there are certain participants in our uh, class today who are from state warehousing corporations, they can also escalate it internally that this is what was told to us. So, if the warehouses are not registered, they should take immediate steps to get it registered. 
Then fourth is the registration process, registration time taken. Those things are, you know, much more simpler today. So earlier, it used to be some four or five months for one registration. So today it is about 30 to 45 days the registration happens. And the last point here, which I have mentioned is the fee for registration. If you see smaller warehouses, they are having less fees and, you know, warehouses beyond 25 metric, uh, 25,000 metric tons. There the fees is 30,000. And this is the fee <coughs> I said earlier for state warehousing corporations. It is waived off till September 22. They need not pay. And with the payment of these fees, any private warehouse, which is, you know, thinking of getting itself registered. So that registration will be valid for five years. There is no other payment needed for the remaining five years. So these are some steps WDRA has taken to simplify the warehouse registration for them to generate ENWRs. Now, these are some statistics, uh, which I think, uh, as I share with Shalindraji, this is uh, for reading purpose, you can use it. So, there is information is self-explanatory here. RPs, I must uh, inform you, RP is repository participant. Uh, RPs are the agencies who are doing the KYC of clients and helping them to open the electronic DMAT account in repository. So, they are spread across the geography as per need. But as I said, since the registered warehouses are itself very less around 3000, little above 3000 today. So the number of RPs and their spread is also very limited to those geographies only. These are some milestones of, uh, you know, uh, repository commencing its operation and then taking it forward to the Derivatives market, as I say, derivatives market, they are the commodity exchanges. And then it is further extending its services to ENAM in 2020. And today we have, you know, all the CWC warehouses, Central Warehousing Corporation warehouses, they are all registered. Wherever they have warehouses for public, CWC warehouses are all registered. NAFED as an uh, as a procurement agency, they procure mostly the oil seeds and pulses for government. We have conducted their pilot in two states in Rajasthan and MP, where they have used the ENWR for their procurement activities. That pilot was also done in collaboration with Central Warehousing Corporation. So initial uh, pilot activity with NAFET is done. So we are waiting for them to use the ENWR full fledged. Challenge at this stage, I would say that if your you know time is a limiting factor, these are certain things they can read also uh, if I share the presentation with them. So these are about the details into how the repository functions. Okay, how repository functions, which are the different stages of ENWR, what are the different uses of ENWR? Okay. So maybe maybe you can uh, is, is skip the operational part, but you can just make them understand the overall system how repository. Yeah, yeah. that I will do. So uh, repository is you know basically where the electronic negotiable warehouse receipt is created on this application, and that creation of application happens with the deposit of goods at the warehouse. And the ENWR life cycle ends with the withdrawal of goods from the warehouse. Now, with this deposit and withdrawal, there are various functions, very complex functions associated with that particular life cycle of ENWR. First and foremost is the DMAT account of the client because all these are electronic. You don't get any physical printed copy of ENWR. You get the credit in your account. All of you must be operating with your debit cards or online transfers with your banks. After the transaction is done, you get one SMS saying 5,000 rupees debited from your savings account, XXX. Similarly, with the operations of DMAT account for the client here, with all the transactions, even the credit of 
say if uh, if we take example of wheat if the wheat is deposited at a warehouse wheat is credited into the account as i say say 100 metric tons of wheat so the quantity of 100 metric tons wheat of a particular grade which is assessed at the warehouse for its quality testing that is credited into the demat account there is no physical receipt or something that the client gets it is the credit into the demat account so after the credit is done suppose the client checks his account he will find that 100 metric tons of wheat appearing in his demat account and if he further explores the details of that he will get the warehouse address he will get the quality he will get the grade he will get the valuation and all the related details so all are available in the electronic form in the demat account of the client since demat account is very important here the kyc of the client also becomes important the identity the address we say in very short there are two things poi and poa proof of identity and proof of address for a client is required and that activity is done by rp repository participant as i said in my previous slide repository participants are the network of agencies who are doing the kyc and demat account opening of the client not only opening for the account maintenance also rp is responsible now the next step is the enwr generation in a registered warehouse now as we are discussing for last almost 50 minutes that registered warehouse can issue enwr a non registered warehouse cannot generate enwr so this is a very controlled environment in which after registration the information comes into repository and the repository issues the uh, you know login credentials to the warehouse to operate on repository with those login credentials only enwr can be generated enwr cannot be generated by any other warehouse which is not having login credentials in a repository now if we compare the traditional method of transfers and transfers in electronic form by the name only you all very well know that electronic transfers are much simpler just a click of a button you know those things are by definition it comes but in terms of agri commodity storage when we are discussing specifically the warehouse of agri commodities we know that how cumbersome it is to transfer when it is not electronic receipt but it is a physical receipt why so because with a physical receipt the owner of the goods has to go to the warehouse with the receipt the warehouse person will actually compare the goods suppose the warehouse receipt say 100 metric tons with so many bags he will compare the actual stock at the warehouse he will compare the actual stock's quality at the warehouse with everything satisfied then the buyer will verify those things the quantity the quality of the stocks and then the actual deal will happen and the transfer will happen suppose there is any mismatch in the perception or the information available with the holder or the information available with the warehouse or the information given to the prospective buyer if there is any kind of mismatch the deal will not happen so deal not happening is almost probable in all the cases in such physical deals some something or other will be missing in the information whereas in electronic transfer you have the complete set of information in your demat account you have the warehouse uh, address you have the uh, commodity quantity as well as quality well defined in the enwr and you have the shelf life well defined and the enwr is backed by the rule of law of the country so the prospective buyer gets much more level of assurance much more level of comfort in dealing in enwr and the best part is for transacting on it there is no physical movement required it is between the holder and the buyer the deal happens the goods stay as it at the warehouse at the most the warehouse gets the information that it has trans it has been transferred from x to y so today onwards the holder is y but otherwise there is no need of somebody approaching the warehouse there is no need of somebody you know carrying the documents to the warehouse or there is no need of somebody even going to the prospective buyer physically 
and physical verification of goods is not at all required in such case of trans. So that is the ease the ENWR brings with itself. You know, uh, many of you uh, who are into warehousing, they, you must be knowing that there are various business arrangements in a warehouse. ENWR particularly deals with those business arrangements where the goods are, you know, there is a public storage involved. That means the warehouse is not storing its own goods. In such case, registration also does not happen and ENWR requirement is absolutely not required. So ENWR is only about such warehouses where there is a public storage facility available. And for such facilities, electronic negotiable warehouse receipt can be issued. For all other types of uh, warehousing practices, warehousing setups, where it is a self-managed warehouse, where the goods are owned by the warehouse owner itself, there is no ENWR required and ENWR for such goods cannot be generated. Now, for the other part, other types of businesses like, you know, reservations done by food corporation or other lease arrangements where their ownership and the operations of the warehouse are well within one entity itself. In such cases, ENWRs are not required. Fine, these are the, you know, pledges we call banks and NBFCs as pledges here. So they are, all are uh, today funding on ENWRs. So that's uh, more for an information I have put this slide that, you know, it is slowly taking the uh, popular route. ENWR is getting popular slow by slow, very slow in fact, but uh, somewhere the initiatives taken by WDRA and government, they will uh, enhance the pace of its getting popular. Mm -hmm.